Oh, hi. Uh, so we're live on the internet right now. That's exciting for everyone, I'm sure. Um, so we're here cross country and cross conference between ZCon 1 in Croatia and MoneroCon in Denver to discuss the regulatory and advocacy environment for privacy preserving cryptocurrencies. We have a full 90 minutes for this conversation. So we're gonna spend the first hour digging deep into some of the issues and then the next 30 doing Q&A. Um, I'm going to throw over to Denver to do their intros and then they can hand back and we'll attempt to do the same. All right, that's fantastic. So um, hello to everyone over in ZCon um, remotely and everyone here in Denver for the Monero uh, first annual, hopefully annual, Conferenzo. Um, here on our end, um, we have me moderating this. Um, my name is Dr. Sarang Noether, um, and I am one of the full-time researchers with Monero Research Lab. I'm conducting research on behalf of and for the Monero Project. And we are very, very pleased to have our two panelists on our end, um, Jerry Brito uh, from uh, Coin Center, and also Eric Voorhees um, from Shapeshift. Um, and if they would like to just take a brief couple of minutes and kind of introduce themselves uh, the way that they see fit and you know why, why they see themselves here and why they're interested in this space. Sure, so um, I'm the executive director of Coin Center. Uh, Coin Center is an independent nonprofit based in DC and we're focused on the public policy issues that affect cryptocurrencies and open permissionless uh, blockchain networks. And um, a big uh, focus for us is privacy and electronic cash. And so I'm very happy to uh, be here uh, engaging really with the Monero uh, community. Um, and uh, I'll just say that on the other end, we have another person from Coin Center uh, at Zcash. So we're very happy to be able, as Coin Center, to be on both sides of the Atlantic on this. Hey, everyone. My name is Eric Voorhees. I'm the founder and CEO of Shapeshift and um, been part of this crypto craze since, since 2011. Oh. Um, Back then, oh, they're not hearing me. We lost audio. Uh oh, do you hear me and or not the others? We've lost audio, guys. Uh oh, it's all going so well. Can you hear me? Can you hear me with what I'm saying right now? Nope, nothing. Still nothing. Still nothing. Damn NSA. Yeah. Who doesn't know who Eric Voorhees is, though? Really. <laughs> Testing, testing. Shall we continue at this end and hope that the audio issues resolve? It's going to be awkward because if we continue on our end, they'll hear us and we won't hear them. <laughs> I'll tell them we can hear them just fine. Yeah, we can hear you guys over there. Okay. 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 So I'm going, great, okay. Um, I'm Amber Balde, I'm co-founder and CEO of Clover. Uh, I'm also on the World Economic Forum's Blockchain Advisory and the board of the Zcash Foundation. Um, with me, we have Jack Gavigan and Peter Van Valkenburg, uh, who I will also let introduce themselves. I am Jack Gavigan. I work with the Electric Coin Company, the company behind Zcash, and uh, I lead regulatory relations for the company. I'm Peter Van Valkenburg. I'm director of research at Coin Center, uh, the organization that Jerry is the executive director of. Um, so I write a lot of our regulatory comments. I've gotten to testify before Congress a couple of times, usually opposite, uh, strangely angry economists from NYU. Um, and uh, I'm also a board member of the Zcash Foundation. Uh, and a quick housekeeping note for this room only. You'll see some white cards in front of you. Uh, we're going to do Q&A by having you write down any questions that strike you over the next hour. And towards the end, we'll just pass them over toward the side of the room and collect them and do it that way. So, OK. So we're going to begin by discussing uh, the regulatory landscape. And I will uh, throw back to Sarang. All right, excellent. Um, and just a brief housekeeping note for uh, the Denver side of things. Um, if anyone in our audience has any questions that they would like to kind of present later on, uh, please raise your hand and one of our assistants will hand you a note card. Please write the question down and then they'll bring the note cards up to me and then we can ensure that we're efficiently answering high quality questions. Um, so the first question that I'll ask over here is gonna be initially directed uh, toward Jerry here. And uh, the question here is, what are some of the main differences around the world in how different societies' views might manifest themselves um, in privacy regulations, both now and in the future? Uh, okay, how different societies' views? 
uh, might manifest themselves. Right. I mean, we we see you know we hear a lot of things from different um, from different countries, for example, <laughs> about what the regulatory landscape looks like or might look like. And I'm wondering how the views of those different societies might manifest themselves in so um, how those regulations come about. Um, Peter's freaking me out because he keeps laughing. Um, <laughs> now we can't hear you. Great. <laughs> Um, so listen, I mean, when you, when you talk about law in the abstract like that, um, it's very difficult. Um, you have to talk a little bit more concretely about what law you're talking about. And typically, when you're talking about privacy, um, you're either talking about consumer privacy or you're talking about anti-money laundering um, uh, uh, type of regulation. And on the anti-money laundering side, which, which probably is uh, the most on point, um, there really isn't much difference um, um, you know, in the world. Uh, and actually just... Um, this week, we saw FATF, um, uh, uh, which is a global um, inter inter intergovernmental organization that um, makes up all of the different uh, financial intelligence units, um, come out with recommendations to, again, try to harmonize across the globe um, what the law is. So there really isn't um, a whole lot of difference. Um, I think where differences emerge um, uh, it's not so much on the privacy side, but it's going to be um, related to how uh, uh, to sanctions, really, right? And different countries are going to have different views on sanctions and um, how um, you know and how appropriate they are. So, yeah, I mean, do you have any do you have any comments on on the same question, not Eric? So much on the privacy side, but it's uh, pro <clears throat> probably one thing that's very difficult, especially for any companies operating in this world, is that. Even within any particular jurisdiction, it's not always clear. And um, which jurisdictions apply to which kind of business activities is itself a very complicated matrix of, of decisions. And um, so what you end up having to do, if you want to try to be compliant and you are located in more than one country, um, is sort of a you know 20 or 30 percent of your business is going toward just trying to navigate um, the gray area and trying to figure out how that all works. Uh, it's horribly counterproductive, and it's been a, a huge difficulty for us. Um, and just kind of, I guess, a brief follow-up on that. So, I mean, we could definitely talk about the FATF um, recent regulations, which are exceptionally new. I mean, those came out formally just, what, a couple of days ago. Um, from what you've seen, you know, based on kind of how these regulations and kind of policy recommendations in an attempt to, like you were saying, Jerry, to kind of unify things around the world, do you see these as overall tending to simplify things for you know, the industry and folks doing work here? Or do you see those as just kind of, you know, being sufficiently vague seeming enough where it's unclear where these gray areas actually lie, like what Eric was saying? No, so uh, the good news um, from the FATF um, is that the recommendations that they ultimately put out are almost identical to what FinCEN has been doing here in the U.S. and what already is law here in the U.S. And so, um, two things are good about that. One is, is that companies operating here in the US don't really have to do anything differently, um, assuming that they're compliant. Um, it's really meant to bring the rest of the world up to the same standard as the US. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, is that um, FinCEN's approach here in the US has been very reasonable um, in our estimation. Um, so number one, it, it you're only affected if you are a custodial firm, if you are, um, uh, uh, accepting and sending funds on behalf of somebody, and in that period of time, you're holding on to funds, you're going to be regulated. And what FinCEN did in uh, recent guidance was clarify very explicitly that if you're non custodial, you're not subject to regulation. If you're simply a developer of software, you're not subject to the regulation. Um, they even specify if you are uh, providing decentralized exchange where you're not taking custody of funds, you are not subject to the regulations. And FATF has. Um, uh, 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 adopted something that's basically identical. So that's all good news. Um, I would hesitate to say that this simplifies because if you are subject to the rules, it's pretty tough to comply. And one thing that in particular is tough to comply with is something that's known as a travel rule, um, about it, which is something that's been um, a rule in the U.S. forever. Exchanges should... Um, now I'm curious to know how ShipShift might be um, complying with the travel rule. Um, but the travel rule has applied to exchanges in the U.S. forever. Um, and now what we're seeing is FATF say every other country in the world needs to adopt 
the US's travel rule. They call it in the FATF language the wire transfer rule. And basically what it says is this, is that if, um, uh, if I have an account um, at Coinbase, um, which is a US-based regulated, um, uh, BSA regulated financial institution, and I want to send money to Sarang, who's got an account at Kraken, let's say, um, when I go to Coinbase and say send money over, Coinbase needs to send along with the transaction um, my name and information and Sarang's name and information to Kraken. And of course, that's almost impossible to comply if what I give Coinbase is simply, a, you know, say a Bitcoin address and say, hey, can you send uh, a Bitcoin from my account to this Bitcoin address? Coinbase has no idea where, you know, whose Bitcoin address is this. Um, it's something that in the banking world, it's very easy to comply with. But in the crypto world, it's not. And um, so now that's going to be the standard around the world. Um, it probably is going to have to mean that they're going to have to be, there's going to have to be a separate channel among exchanges. Um, and so that's going to be difficult, I think, to comply with. Yeah, I mean, in our particular model, we're only sending assets back to a customer, uh, back to the one who sent them to us. So we, we don't have that issue. Um, but it's, it's going to be a huge pain for any any kind of exchange because there's no way that they can ever know, you know, even if there's a, a second level of communication between some of these exchanges, um, that will preclude new entrants in the market from being able to, to do that because how do they get into that group and when and how? And when you said you send back, you only send back, what do you do? You always send back to the same address that's sent to you? No, it's in our terms that you can only send crypto back to yourself. To yourself, okay. I was gonna say, imagine a world where we move to we move to a world where exchanges only send back to you, they never send to each other. That actually encourages people to hold their own coins and send them peer to peer to each other. So it's kind of interesting what the effect of the regulation might be. Yeah, I think it's definitely gonna be interesting to see how you know businesses and different kinds of industries evolve to meet some of these new regulations as they kind of get flushed out. Can, can I suggest something? Maybe, I don't know if this, this is outside the script, but Peter's an expert on uh, BSA and FATF. So maybe he has something to say to add to this. Yeah, I mean, if you if you uh, if you'd like to go ahead and jump in, I, I think that'd be fine. That'd be fine. About what's coming next? I'm sorry, I can't hear your oh, audio. FATF. <laughs> what's that? The FATF question. We we're going to just <laughs> later. What does FATF what about mean, Peter? FATF? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, Jerry, Jerry well, had a question, kind of passing back to, to Peter, if that's all right. It, it's fine. I, I guess what we were we were going to discuss was simply um, sharing all this customer data when fulfilling customer transactions down the chain might extend also to personal wallet management even. So uh, how might that impact how individuals even have to know about and engage with that kind of uh, law? Which law are we talking about? We're talking about, about the financial ask action task. task force. Okay, the recommendations. And, that the, and the travel rule, Peter. The travel rule. Oh, well, the best thing about the travel rule from a from the standpoint of individual end users is that the travel rule only applies to regulated entities. In the U.S., BSA regulated entities, and for the European equivalent of the U.S. travel rule, i.e. the wire transfer rule, in FATF's recommendations, VASPs, or virtual asset service providers, as defined in the, in the new, newly defined term in the glossary that FATF released um, just two days ago. And those definitions, as I think Jerry was saying on his end, although I, I, I couldn't hear, are entirely focused on people who actually have at least transient custody of other person's virtual currency. And that, that, that means that even if someone is perhaps writing wallet software that's like a multi-sig wallet, and even if they are holding, say, one out of three keys in a multi-sig smart contract, they don't have custody. And um, FinCEN was quite clear about this fact in their guidance that was released last uh, May. Uh, and we were a little bit concerned that maybe the FATF wouldn't follow suit, uh, in particular because the United Kingdom began a consultation to implement its money laundering laws under the European Union's fifth money laundering directive and suggested that we know that the, so this is me parroting the UK now, we know that the FATF is about to release its recommendations, and we know that they may want us to go beyond the EU money laundering directive and regulate more parties. And in that UK consultation, they said, maybe we should extend the scope of money laundering obligations, in other words, people who have to know their customers, 
to open source software developers, to persons facilitating decentralized exchange, and they had a couple other things on the list. And so while we didn't participate actively in the FATF recommendations, because from our understanding of them, they were going to be just fine, when the UK mentioned that they were effectively using the, the FATF recommendations as a, as a sort of justification for going further, we said, okay, well, we definitely need to participate in the UK's consultation about how they uh, implement 5MLD. And what we did was we, we wrote a, a, a pretty comprehensive comment to the UK arguing that this would, this would be a departure from US policy under FinCEN, so you'd be going well beyond US standards. Uh, it would be uh, impractical uh, entirely for people to comply with. I, I, like which open source developer in the Monero repositories or in the, in the Zcash GitHub repositories or in the Bitcoin Core repositories is obligated to know all the people that use these networks. It's, it's, it's hard to even know what that would mean or how that would work. And we also argued um, that it would be effectively unconstitutional according to the sort of unwritten UK constitution, uh, which is, you know, a, a deep and long-standing respect for the rule of law. You don't have a written one, uh, Jack. But it's much like Bitcoin's <laughs> protocol, right? It's, it's true. No specification, just a, just a thing that's running. Um, usually running. <laughs> Uh, and moment. also uh, in violation of the International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, primarily, if you start mass surveilling people who use cryptocurrency by mandating that the authors of the software bake surveillance into the code, you're really doing the most insidious and complete bulk collection of data that you can imagine. This isn't, this isn't collection from an entity who's established a customer relationship with somebody, opened an account for them, and is on some level of face-to-face -face interaction. This is surveillance simply because you chose to install some software on your computer. Uh, and that would be a radical departure. Um, and aside from that, which are, which are sort of Fourth Amendment concerns in the US and concerns with the similar articles in the um, International Covenants, uh, where you should have specific specificity with respect to who you're surveilling. You can't do blanket surveillance. That's that's a, a general tenet of the Fourth Amendment, and you can make these arguments with respect to international covenants on human rights. Aside from those Fourth Amendment-like arguments, there's also First Amendment and uh, the free speech equivalents in, in international law and European law, which is assuming that people don't want to comply with this rule and bake surveillance into the software that they write, and I think it's right to assume that a lot of people in this room would be very vehemently in favor of not complying and for the right reasons. Um, assuming people don't want to comply, could you compel them to comply? Could you say you must write code this way? That gets into a matter of compelled speech. And if you don't comply, uh, can you actually ban the publication and distribution of the source code? as it travels through the internet in the UK or in the US for that matter? And I think the answer is pretty unequivocally no. Um, you know, there are limits to your free speech rights, but this would be, I think, extremely overbroad as far as quashing legitimate speech that is non-criminal. And so laws that do restrict speech need to be narrowly tailored to achieve the results that are desired by policymakers. And a law that says, no, you, you, just, can't, you just can't share cryptocurrency software anymore it's not narrowly tailored because, sure, it might stop the crime or the, bads, the bad things that you want to stop. It also is going to stop innumerable legitimate use cases for this technology, um, chief among them being a, a bulwark against totalitarianism and corporate data collection, which are things that I think liberal democracies should be very much in favor of uh, and, and learn, to, uh, learn to love rather than fear. So we sent that comment into the UK. Um, I've sort of gone backwards in explaining some of it. Um, we first wrote a paper about the constitutional arguments as they would be made in the US context under the Fourth and the First Amendment. So the European comment was, or the UK comment was sort of based on that paper. So if the constitutional arguments about why forcing developers or persons who are non-custodial with respect to people's virtual currency, why forcing those people to collect information about their users is unconstitutional. If those arguments are interesting to you, I, I definitely recommend picking up our recently published report on um, electronic cash decentralized exchange and the Constitution. Uh, it's available on the Coin Center website.
So where we have some regulation pushing towards ever more aggressive disclosure, and at the same time, we have a growing climate of public concern about privacy and more regulation coming forward to attempt to mandate data privacy laws and how things are collected and controlled. They're all coming from agencies that don't necessarily speak to each other in yeah. jurisdictions with different kind of personalities. So are we headed towards a climate where these things uh, start to bump up against and potentially conflict with each other? Or is it inherent that finance and data will always stay in their own lands? So, I mean, I think we're already seeing lots of bumping up against each other. The EU's GDPR is a very different way of looking at privacy and regulation than what we have in the US. Um, the easiest way to just point that out briefly is that the GDPR really doesn't protect you from searches from governments at all. It's like a giant loophole or a carve out or it just wasn't the goal of the thing. The goal of the thing was to keep European data on European servers and prevent American companies from exploiting it outside of European laws. It had nothing to do with protecting European citizens from their own governments. And that's a very American perspective of me to express because in America, we're strangely comfortable, maybe recently with the you know interest that Congress has shown in Facebook and other big tech companies. But generally speaking, that aside, we're strangely comfortable usually with corporate data collection and extraordinarily uh, wary of government surveillance. And so our privacy laws, to the extent we have them, are really all constitutional arguments. And the difference between just an ordinary statutory law and a constitutional law, broadly speaking, is that an ordinary statutory law regulates things like people and companies. And an ordinary constitutional law is the outer limits of what governments are allowed to do, state governments or the federal government in the US. So, most of the discussion about privacy and data retention and surveillance in the US is about what does the NSA know about me and what should they be allowed to know about me? And I feel like most of the discussion in the European Union is more about what do corporations know about me? And I don't mean to express a really sort of one-sided American viewpoint here. I think corporate data exploitation is getting worse and worse and especially worse in cases where corporations are in league with governments to basically surveil and rate citizens. And hopefully you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say surveil and rate. The key sort of example here is what China's doing with Alipay and WeChat, um, basically accumulating massive amounts of data about all the financial transactions of Chinese citizens and inputting it transparently and openly. They, they'll admit that they're doing this. Uh, to a social credit score that the, the government will help maintain. And if your score goes too low because you said something unpatriotic or you bought something that you shouldn't buy, you just can't travel abroad anymore. You can't maybe take high speed rail. Maybe your bank, all your transactional accounts get closed. Who knows what happens to you? So, it's a, it, so we've got three approaches globally right now. We've got a US approach that's maybe too fixated on government surveillance and not enough on corporate surveillance. A European approach that I definitely think trusts its governments too much and is maybe a little too wary of corporations. And you've got what I, I hate to be so, you know, down on the Chinese because I, I, I love the people, but I'm wary of their government. Um, that seems to be fairly indifferent about both corporate and state surveillance. I think that's a fair description of, of the UK approach. Certainly there've been a few cases where UK law enforcement intelligence services have been found, have been conducting effectively bulk surveillance, bulk, bulk collection of data. It's been declared to be illegal, but there've been no consequences. Yeah. Um, or the law has then been changed to make it legal. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny, because I was looking for precedent to write our UK comment, and it's interesting. The, all the cases in the, in, in the European Convention uh, literature on privacy rights under the European Convention, the, the defendants or the, 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 the nations that have been brought up in front of the, the court are either Russia, or the UK. <laughs> it's a good company. It's not, not a great company. <laughs> I only live in the UK. I'm Irish, by the way. So. Okay. And um, well, while we're also talking about the UK, they have much more stringent uh, open banking uh, data laws, mm -hmm. requirements that people can then access their data. And the US has been looking at that. There were some proposals, perhaps wrapping that into Dodd Frank even. And yet there's been no traction. And I've um, had conversations with people involved there in uh, the the Dodd-Frank regulation, and they've simply said, we don't 
answer this. We're not, they would not even take the questions. Um, so do you think that that is going to come to the US and are we learning from that? Are we going to replicate uh, errors of GDPR and or is take back your data better? I mean, what are we learning and what should we really be doing differently? I mean, you, you generally look at like, take out your data type language and it's pretty weak sauce, right? So you look at like Dodd-Frank 1033 and there's all sorts of exceptions to when the company should give data to the customer. One of the big ones being, it's just not commonly available in the regular course of business. Like it's too much trouble is basically <laughs> what that legal language would probably mean. And I'm not an expert in the European um, uh, open banking laws, but to me, this is the wrong approach. And the fundamentally right approach is not to expect governments to force corporations to make their data available to people. It is to replace corporations with open protocols that have their data available to the people. It's something that, thank you. It's something that um, Eli Ben Sasson said at a speech in Stanford recently that he called inclusive accountability. So why do you trust your bank? Because it's audited by one of the big four accounting firms and it's chartered by a government. There's a few people who make sure that the bank is accountable. Why do you trust, if you trust the Monero or the Zcash blockchain? Because there's thousands of people around the world who can download the open source software, run it on a commonly you know, available internet connected device and check all the math. And yeah, there's still a barrier in the inclusivity of that accountability. You need to be fairly sophisticated to do those checks yourself. But this is a set of thousands versus a set of one or two or three. So from, from my perspective, and this is, this is my personal view, we've never really t taken this issue of open banking on at Coin Center. I, I'm not optimistic about those laws because they'll always have sort of ways to weasel out and not share data that you should be sharing. I'm optimistic about technology that replaces the companies those laws would apply to. In, 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 in Europe, the, the open banking stuff kind of, uh, it, it grew out of a desire to spur competition amongst the banks. It, um, it, then the UK spearheaded and took it further than, than, than probably the EU would have gone by itself and, and, and took a leadership role there. They, the, the, the purpose of it was, to allow, was basically to allow customers to choose with whom their banking data would be shared because it was locked up inside the banks. And, and in the UK, unlike uh, other countries, there, the, the vast majority of the banking uh, sector was controlled by six large groups, I think now five. And um, it was just locked up in there. You couldn't get it out except for screen scraping or, or scanning in your, your, your statements. So it was um, the, the whole open banking work in the UK was about unlocking that data, making it available to third party providers with the appropriate permission of the, of the data subject. And, um, and unleashing innovation for people to, you know, take data, combine it, have a single view across all their accounts. I think in the U.S., the, the company played, um, PLAID uh, did, did something similar, um, but uh, in, in the U.K. now it's being done using APIs mm -hmm. properly instead of using screen scraping. And I would love to talk more about open banking, but I'm going to throw it back to Denver to make sure we don't go too long, so please take it back. Sure. Um, so uh, kind of a question throwing over to Eric. So you have built a you know, pretty successful business kind of in this space as the regulatory landscape seems to have been evolving over time. Um, and so since businesses like yours, you know, coming under, you know, perhaps more intense regulation, interact with customers and clients from around the world who may be subject to different sorts of regulations, you know, how do you see some of these practical considerations being addressed by businesses? And you know, where do you see this going? Are, are regulated entities like yours going to end up taking kind of a, a most conservative approach when dealing with customers and clients from around the world? Or do you kind of have to sort of tailor your interactions based on jurisdiction? Where is this going? Yeah, good question. Uh, one, one theme that I've seen in the, in the crypto world is that you tend to have companies that get of a certain size, and you know, Coinbase being the, the best example of this, um, they feel that they have to be you know, overly compliant, and in some senses they do. Um, they have to look exactly like a bank and probably be more diligent about a lot of these regulations than banks because they're under much more scrutiny than banks. And, then, um, and, they, and they feel so paranoid about that position that they do not feel that they can speak out against 
any of those regulations that they themselves are, are under. Uh, and then you have sort of the, the polar opposite, which are the you know, anonymous developers around the world who haven't built a company but feel comfortable being uh, outspoken and writing amazing technology that pr uh, preserves people's privacy by default. And there isn't a lot in the middle there. And so I think what we at Shapeshift are trying to do is build a real big business that's highly profitable and gets well known around the world and do it while speaking out against a lot of these issues. Um, and I think that platform is something that's going to be very important. I'm hoping that we won't be the only company that does that. Um, Kraken has done a great job with this as well. And I'm hoping that as the crypto industry grows around the world, we'll see lots of companies that, to the extent that they feel that they need to comply with certain rules, they also can feel comfortable at the same time speaking out against those rules and conveying why they're unethical. Interesting. I mean, you kind of, you kind of briefly hinted at you know the role that developers and engineers and folks who kind of work on some of these asset projects either play or don't play in this. Do you see there being more room for relationships to be built between developers and you know some of these entities that you know build businesses around those projects? Like, is there a role for these these both to play to kind of fill that middle ground? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Hydra approach, right? So lots of people taking lots of different strategies to grow crypto generally as an alternative to the fiat financial system. And that's going to range from, from people um, doing all sorts of different strategies um, all, all around the world, using different messaging, using different tactics, um, building different types of projects ranging from the very distributed to the very centralized. Uh, and I'm, I, I want to see more of that kind of diversity in the approach. Hmm. And kind of putting on the spot here, so you know, knowing where the regulatory landscape you know is right now and maybe appears to be going, um, is there anything that you would have done dif done differently building up Shapeshift, knowing that you know this you know wherever we are now would be coming? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a million mistakes we've made that I I wish I could. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm not change. asking you to go and enumerate all the mistakes you feel like you've made, but you know, kind of more broadly speaking. You know, is, is or, or for that matter, if you were to give advice to someone else trying to build up a business in this space, you know, would you, you know, would you, would you have any advice to give that person knowing that this regu the regulatory environment is where it is now? Um, probably the, the advice would be for people that are trying to build a crypto business to realize that you're taking on not only the struggle of a startup, which is very hard to do itself, but taking on the struggle of, um, of a regulatory battle for, m for many, maybe most crypto companies, they have to take on that challenge of a regulatory battle, which is immensely costly, um, carries certain personal risk to, the, to them, and um, dealing with both of those challenges at the same time. And just recognizing that that is going to be the struggle you have to deal with, I think, ahead of time is, is very helpful to people. Probably that will scare a lot of people away from ever building. And that's really, that's really sad. That's really tragic. Um, w one of the most harmful parts of all this regulation are the unseen businesses that never get built, the unseen features that never get released uh, because people were too scared, too nervous, too frightened. They didn't want to go to jail and have their family ruined because they were worried that some regulator was going to shut them down for trying to build something that protected people's privacy. Um, that's a really tragic state of the world. And so it's really encouraging that it hasn't been shut down completely. Can I say, I, th I think um, like an unintended consequence, going back to unintended consequences of regulation being um, as unforgiving as it is for lots of business models, is that um, I think that drives people to think about how do you build it in such a way where it's pure software, right? And you're not putting yourself at risk. And so um, I, you know, that's kind of like a good unintended consequence that, that I think will come from this. Yeah, the, the life finds a way from Jurassic Park, I think is, is very, very prevalent in crypto. Crypto finds a way. <laughs> It went great for Jurassic Park, didn't it? <laughs> it went great for the dinosaurs. <laughs> That's true. All right. Depends which side you're on, I guess. Um, so now I guess we'll go ahead and pass it back uh, off to Zcon at Croatia for more questions. Sure. Um, so kind of just to tag off of what Eric was saying, Jack, you handle regulatory engagement for Zcash. And I would assume that a lot of people outside of this area might think that that's an extremely difficult conversation. But you've been very proactive and had a remarkable amount of success uh, in that area. So can you talk a little bit about how you approach it and what it is um, that has made them not, I guess, slam the door in your face? 
So I think number one, put on a suit. <laughs> that that, that, that strangely right. helps a lot. Um, if you if you show up and and you look like you belong in their in their meeting room, then then that helps a lot. Um, I've seen Zuko in a suit now several times. It's a it's a scary sight. Um, it's probably zebra. better than the zebra suit he's been wearing here. <laughs> he's so. wearing a zebra onesie right now. Um, I think I think step one is um, is is when 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 you kick off the engagements or when when you first meet them. Um, what I've done is I've acknowledged the uh, validity of the goals that they are pursuing. So I say, look, we don't want to see Zcash being used by criminals. We don't want to see Zcash being used to fund terrorism. Let's get that out of the way, you know, straight away. And then it um, it, it 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 means that you can then progress from a shared uh, platform, and then it's about educating them about what Zcash is and what it's not. Um, what I found is that there's there, there's normally uh, this misunderstanding that privacy somehow equates to anonymity, and that an exchange that lists Zcash is unable to KYC its customers. And of course, that's absolutely ridiculous. But these people are not technologists. They don't understand these protocols. They don't understand cryptocurrency. So a large part of what I do is, is education and walking them through just how Zcash can be compatible and is compatible with all of the regulations that, that apply to prevent money laundering and, 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 um, and terrorist financing. I was at the, the FANF meeting where uh, back in May, where, where these new recommendations were being were being discussed, and um, you know when I, when, I, when I commented about the paragraph seven B, the travel rule equivalent um, that applies to, to virtual asset service providers, you know I was able to start off by saying, you know, be, before I go any further, I want to make it clear that I've got no dog in this fight because Zcash is compliant with this rule. You can you can send the beneficiary uh, and the originator information along with a shielded Zcash transaction. You can. You can, but you you do not have to. You don't right? have to, no, no. But you, but it's an it means so. So the, the the big challenge that that exchanges are facing now is it looks like they're going to have to build an entirely new messaging system, the basically a shadow version or a, or, or a crypto version of Swift in order to pass this information back and forth amongst them. It's a lot easier if you can just attach it to the to the transaction itself. So, um, you know, the, uh, acknowledging the validity of of the goals that they're pursuing. Uh, educating them, and then saying to them, look, you know, how can we work together to make it easy for people to be compliant whilst at the same time maintaining their privacy? You know, and, and, and really, when you, when you engage in, in a constructive discussion like that, um, it becomes far, far, becomes far more positive and far more constructive. Um, and it's, it's, you know, we've, we've, we've had success, you know, uh, both in the States um, we've got a good relationship in, in the UK. We, uh, we're hoping to start to expand that. We're, we're looking at Japan, where I think there's a fair, the, 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 there's, there's a misunderstanding about um, what uh, privacy coins, as, they, as, a, as they're often called, um, are used for and what the purpose of them is. So um, it, it's, really about, it's really about getting on the same page, education, and not adopting an adversarial position. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we've all spent time speaking with regulators, and I think if you don't do that much, they do seem like this kind of singular organism, but really there are lots of individuals there. And it's kind of like lawyers, like you need to find a lawyer that's going to have a position that starts from a place that you can work with. Um, some will always start from no, some will start from, well, let me see, right? So how much do you think that some of the individuals that you've engaged with at these agencies, um, that their beliefs have actually impacted things. I'm thinking specifically about some of the um, names that have shown up in the headlines, like former CFTC commissioners uh, that you know decided to take this on personally. But do you think that those kind of advocates could really change the entire um, kind of game, or is at the end of the day, is the organization larger than that individual? I mean, so both, both of you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, agencies are made up of people, and people have each of them idiosyncratic and unique ideas and beliefs. And we run into a ton who, uh, they love that Coin Center reached out to them to give a briefing because they're excited about the technology, not because it, they necessarily see it as a threat to their job, to, to, to the policy that they're trying to achieve, because they just think it's, it's, it's another exciting development in the, in the world of technology. Um, and then we find people who are deeply skeptical, who 
you, you arrive and, and the immediate thought is this is a tool for nothing but money laundry and, and, and terrorist finance. And so you're right, making those personal connections and, 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 and starting where they're starting is important. But I suppose it's always going to be like that. What, what could fundamentally change things and which is primarily the, the reason for why we think Coin Center should be around is that one day it could be much more monolithic. It could be less, um, this is a slow burning policy concern of a lot of people and different people have different opinions. And it could change to suddenly this is something monumental that must be addressed and it becomes much more public and people are all thinking in mass about it. And that could be triggered by various things. It could be triggered by a terrorist attack being uh, quite clearly funded using virtual currencies, which we've never really seen. We've seen tiny amounts used to support um, or, or attempted you know, support uh, of terrorist organizations through relatively trivial amounts, but that could change. And if that changed, it would be a much bigger conversation, at which point you'd have to not start at the sort of human personal level, but start at the sort of first principles, which is why we've started writing a lot about constitutional law, um, which is why we've started writing a lot about look, these, these tools will be used as all tools are for both good and evil. It's important um, if you're trying to achieve a policy result uh, not to um, stifle all the good just because you're so concerned about the evil. Another thing that could, could, trigger, could trigger a more monolithic policy conversation and it might already be happening is a major uh, company deciding to release a uh, cryptocurrency. So Facebook's Libra announcement has certainly completely changed the timbre of conversations in Washington, D.C., at least if, if I believe the headlines, because I haven't even been there since the announcement. I've been here in Croatia. But I think that's definitely, it, it could either be good or bad for the open projects like Zcash or Monero. It could, on one hand, give people who are skeptical of this thing uh, a more obvious target because they already don't like Facebook for privacy violations. And then we can say, well, yeah, and, and actually our stuff is, is truly private rather than just having to trust Facebook. Or it could be very bad for everyone if some overreaction triggered by the current dissatisfaction, it seems, from Congress with Facebook um, that triggers sort of monolithic cryptocurrency legislation or something like that that is overbearing and, and extreme. I'm sure Jerry probably has things to say about that. I saw him reaching for his mic. <laughs> What I'll say is, um, th th I was saying this yesterday here, I've never seen um, such a swift and clear reaction from the Hill for, um, to an announcement as I, ha as I saw with the Libra announcement. Within 48 hours, less than 48 hours of the announcement, Senate Banking and House Financial Services had announced a hearing. Um, we're basically calling them into the principal's office, right? Um, what I'll say is, you know, I think Peter's right. You could get different kinds of reaction triggered by that announcement, but I think it's going to be more like the first reaction, which is because Libra is um, centralized, it's, it has a reserve that is run by an organization, and there's a very clear target, and that target is one that comes from a very uh, today unpopular on the Hill um, organization, I think that's going to draw all the attention. Um, and I think a lot of the questions related to Libra are not so much about money laundering and the like. It's going to be about um, the reserve, right? So it's a stable coin. It's very different from everything else, um, uh, like Zcash um, and Monero um, and Bitcoin. And so I think that's what's, what's going to attract uh, I think pri uh, privacy concerns, because Facebook has not had a good track record on privacy, is going to be the first thing. But once the, the banking committee start thinking about it a little bit, they're going to yeah. look and see this reserve and start asking themselves all kinds of questions about, well, how is this regulated? Um, and that's what I think is going to draw a lot of focus. Um, and that can be good or bad. Um, I think uh, uh, for open permissionless crypto, I think what our job at Coin Center is going to have to be over the next few months is to just be on the lookout to make sure that um, folks in Congress do not get confused about Libra and Monero and Zcash and Bitcoin. We have to go in there and explain the difference between permissioned and permissionless, between something that has a reserve and something that ha that is um, a, 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 um, uh, a bearer asset, um, and just keep 
um, uh, hammering at that distinction. That's going to be our, our number one job. And then the other thing I would say quickly is, you know, we thought we had, so we've, you know, since Coin Center started, we've been on the lookout for that Black Swan event that triggers a reaction um, where people stop thinking rationally individually and it becomes this monolithic groupthink um, in reaction to some event. And we thought we had one, um, uh, which I guess I can talk about now, which is um, uh, the, there was an indictment um, against Russians by um, the uh, special counsel's office by Robert Mueller. Um, and it dropped on a f Friday. Um, and that indictment um, uh, explained how Russians uh, interfered with the US election. And part of what the technology that they used was Bitcoin. Um, and th that dropped on a Friday. On Tuesday, there was going to be a hearing um, about cryptocurrency. Um, it was going to be it was going to be focused on sort of securities law, right? So hangover from the ICO stuff. Um, and we're like, okay, um, this is it, right? Um, th th Democrats on Capitol Hill were very focused on obviously um, uh, the Russia investigation. Um, there was going to be a hearing. This is, you know, Bitcoin was used by Russians to interfere in U.S. elections. Um, and we were ready for it. We, we prepared. We were ready um, for that. And nothing happened. But the, which all which the great. news I stories mean, that, all the news stories that came out, and um, when we talked to folks um, on Capitol Hill, they basically, um, uh, I don't want to say parroted. Uh, they um, basically uh, talked about it the way we've been talking about use of this technology for a long time, which is this is a tool. You know what else the uh, Russian hackers used? They used email, and they used PayPal, and they used um, planes because they came over here, right? And we we didn't um, uh, have any rea you know negative reaction to those technologies, and so that's how it, you know it was portrayed. Um, you know, just as a technology that was misused, which was good. That, that happened to be the congressional hearing that Tuesday that I testified oh, yeah, right. at. And it did yeah. come up uh, during the discussion, but as, uh, we kind of got them by the end. Uh, I think the, um, the guy who kind of led the whole discussion had simply said, listen, as long as the criminals keep using Bitcoin, it sounds like we can trace it and that's great. Mm. So they were happy about that. Um, I did get a follow-up question and then a written follow-up uh, where they were saying, but with something like these privacy coins, how are we supposed to do the same thing? So they are aware that there's a differentiation and um, we can say that you can create a system where there is this kind of disclosure like Jack is talking about, but that's a very different thing than, than and they do understand the difference between um, we can force everyone to disclose and we will never be able to fully satisfy that law enforcement question. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you asked before about the different individuals and the different agencies, and d d different agencies and regulators have got different focuses, foci, focuses. Um, you know, the, the SEC cares about security law, uh, FinCEN, Department of Treasury care about uh, sanctions violations and, um, and money laundering, um, and the law enforcement care about catching the bad guys. You know, law enforcement uh, are not there to protect our, our right to privacy. They're, they're, they're there to catch bad guys. So when you talk to different different uh, uh, regulators and policymakers, the the conversation changes. And and in some cases, um, a good conversation to have is to talk about the consequences of wholesale breaches of privacy, and to couch it in the context of interference in democratic elections, um, which is enabled by, you know, foreigners. Uh, foreign state actors being able to surveil people through uh, platforms that are not private. Uh, and that that does actually, you can, sometimes when you say that, you can see the cog start to turn to realize, actually, this is a national security issue. And coincidentally, when Congresswoman Maxine Waters uh, published her statement about, um, you know, call, calling on Facebook to stop development of Libra until um, uh, Congress can get to grips with it, she put privacy and national security right next to, to one another in the sentence. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, sometimes it feels like these people aren't listening, but I think that actually um, sometimes the message feels like it is actually seeping through. 
And I can say, um, right before I flew out here, I was at Fortune's Brainstorm Finance Conference, which was um, pretty fun, great group of people, but it's very kind of banking executives. There were definitely former high-level regulators and things in the room. Um, and uh, we did a, a lunch about blockchain. Um, and it, of course, descends to regulation very, very quickly. And exactly that point that um, they this former regulator literally said, uh, you know, I understand the human rights argument here, but my job as a regulator is to exert our jurisdiction, figure out what falls into this, and to make rules and uh, make sure everyone kind of stays within that rule set um, and find people that need enforcement actions filed against them. My, my, and we cannot, we do not, and we cannot really coordinate globally, even though we all individually understand that problem set, um, which is definitely challenging. And at my closing statement there was, gosh, this has been really fun talking about regulation for so long, but now I'm really excited to fly to ZCon where I can talk with developers and not have to talk about regulation. <laughs> um, so here we are. Uh, okay, so I'm going to throw back over, maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of the engineering side again. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've talked about kind of uh, the advocacy perspective, the business perspective, and things like that, and a lot of these, a lot of this regulatory environment can kind of seem like a minefield where, you know, there's all sorts of new mines being placed all the time, and it's kind of tough to see where to go. So where, you know, if anywhere, do you see the role of people like protocol developers and engineers who are building these things? What, what role, if any, do you think that they should be playing in some of these interactions between the users of the assets and you know perhaps miners and exchanges and regulators and governments and you know what role if any should they be playing and it's a very very broad question but maybe kind of go in kind of a round robin and see what everyone on the panel thinks about this yeah so um, a few things I mean I think number one they should be continue to build what they're building right because um, uh, that's really what matters and that's what's going to allow people to do what they want to do in the world and not have to worry so much about regulation. So continue to build what you're building, but as you do that, one thing you might want to do is try to stay abreast of what are the regulatory pain points um, that uh, people who um, are, are trying to do um, different activities at a layer above the protocol might be experiencing, and ask yourself, is there a way that you can um, basically uh, have code eat that? Right? and abstract it away so that um, it's not subject to regulation. And you have to remember, you know, the reason we have regulation um, is because um, there is some risk to the public that we have regulation to address. And typically that's gonna be associated with custody, right? Because if you have a firm that's providing a service and in order to do that, they're taking custody of your funds, Let's say it's exchange, let's say it's a tip bot service, let's say it's a wallet, um, whatever it may be, uh, let's say it's escrow. They're taking custody of consumer funds, they're creating a risk to consumers, and that's where the government says, hey, here are the standards that you've got to follow. Um, uh, I'm going to take a little issue with yeah. that real quick. Yeah. Okay. I think that is often conveyed by them as this is important because customers have money at risk. But if you actually look at the laws and the attention that regulators have put down on companies, their guidance isn't about yeah. best standards for keeping funds safe. 100% 100, 100 agree. Right? It's, it's like yeah. best standards for how to surveil your people and yeah. report it back to the government. But here's my point. The risk is the hook for them to say, we, this is why we have regulation. And so my point is to developers, protocol developers, other engineers working on this, figure out, if you can keep abreast of, of, of what the regulatory pain points are, figure out what risks can you eliminate by getting rid of custody, and then there is no hook for regulation. That's, that's my point. I mean, any, anything uh, comment-wise to add, Eric, since yeah, you, you, know, I, you, you know a lot about custody and non-custody I mean, and what you do? Yeah. I mean, one, one, one thing I'm a little, you know, I guess cynical on is, you know, the early version of Shapeshift, um, we, we didn't have user accounts and we didn't do KYC. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't, I mean, the goal wasn't really so that everyone could be anonymous. The goal was because that actually helped protect people. So we had two, two kind of pillars. One was that we didn't take custody, and one was that we didn't have accounts with a whole bunch of personal information that people didn't want to give us in the first place. Um, I felt very proud of building that because it protected people um, in a world where data breaches happen all the time, ranging from small companies up to 
the targets of the world and the IRS and you know the federal government itself. To be able to, to interact online with people without taking their personal information seemed like a huge benefit for the world, like a, a great achievement. Um, and yet that is completely cast aside because regulators actually don't care about protecting consumers. They don't actually care about that generally. They use that as a pretext to control and surveil people. And I found that to be deeply troubling. And um, I think in a world where consumer protection was actually lauded, much of what crypto technology has built, which allows people to transact freely and openly and without lots of fraud um, that happens in the traditional world, that would be something heralded by these regulators, and it, it has not been. So is, is there a role that, you know, that, that developers and, you know, and, and folks building these protocols can play? Yeah, I mean, keep doing what you're doing. I, you know, one of the amazing bright spots in, in the crypto advancement is that it is still legal for an engineer to build software that lets people transact privately with each other, right? Like Monero and Zcash are great examples of this. Um, that's legal. And no one currently is contesting that that's legal. And lots of engineers around the world are building those things. And people feel relatively safe doing so. That's amazing. And so as long as that continues, you know, that's the ultimate bulwark, I think, against any of the surveillance stuff. Because even if certain companies uh, get compromised by that, um, the industry can always retreat back into the lower level protocol work. So what everyone needs to be very diligent against is any kind of advancement by regulators to try to regulate the actual writing of code. Thank goodness that that gets into constitutional issues and free speech issues and that there's no precedent for that. Um, I hope it stays that way. Yeah, I'd love to hear the, the thoughts on the panels from the Zcon side on the same question. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and that's why we felt the need about almost a year ago now to really pivot to um, at Coin Center talking about electronic cash and why it's a, f a fundamental advance that will improve human flourishing and human dignity um, to make the moral case, as Jerry did in a paper that he published, and then to make uh, a constitutional law argument in the U.S. Um, about Fourth Amendment and First Amendment rights and why any attempt to do something horrendously overbroad and regulate open source software developers would be unconstitutional. Um, so we can fight them on their own terms if there was ever this, this appetite. And, you know, what's, what's been a, a really satisfying thing for, for, for me to watch is that we haven't had to fight this since we released these papers. Quite the opposite, at least for now, um, FinCEN, the FATF, um, and probably the UK too, even though they raised this question in a consultation. I think they were just looking for input, really. Um, none of these states have uh, really gone down that road. In fact, they've, FATF and the US have made clear statements that even a, a developer of software for a decentralized exchange, like ZeroX, for example, and even somebody who maybe even helps run that software and make it available to the world, like a, a radar relay or something like that, as long as they don't take custody, they don't fit into our rule sets. And th th there's clear statements in both the FATF uh, interpretive note that came out two days ago that those entities would not fall under uh, financial surveillance obligations. And there's clear statements in FinCEN's guidance from, from last May. And then just on the broader question that this, this round of the panel was supposed to discuss of, um, you know, what can developers do? Uh, I wanted to, for once, I mean, it's probably not the first time um, caution developers or tell developers to, to be much more careful than some of them have been. Um, never pretend that what you've built uh, or maybe what you're doing is fundamentally different because it's technology when it's not fundamentally different. And the, the, the biggest existential threat we've had, uh, at least from Coin Center's perspective to this technology, was the ICO boom. It was absurd. It was gross and abhorrent that people raised incredible amounts of money on promises of future cryptocurrencies that they hadn't developed yet. And these are developers. It's not them in their capacity as developers. It's in this case, them in their capacity as people who are raising money. And that could be fine, but I think it was fairly clear that in a lot of situations, you might be running afoul of US securities laws. And so 
there should have probably been more due diligence um, and more effort to make sure that you didn't run afoul of those laws. You know, not defending those laws, they're just the laws. Um, and then what really bothered me about the ICO boom and some of the responses to the ICO boom was this attempt by some to claim that because you were selling a token or a promise of a token, it was somehow suddenly not a securities issuance. Um, even though there was an investment of money and a reliance upon your efforts for profits that you had effectively promised. Putting a token label on it, making it a blockchain project does not mean that if you raise a bunch of money from investors and make promises of capital appreciation that you have an issue to security. And arguing that, well, because it's new technology, it should get a pass is the wrong argument. You might think that the accredited investor rule that limits people's ability to buy your token to rich people in, in, in uh, Sand Hill Road uh, in, in San Francisco, uh, in Palo Alto, is abhorrent, and, and, and that might be a good argument. But then your enemy is securities laws writ large and investor protection laws as they're specified in the U.S. writ large. You've got to lobby to change the way we do capital formation. You don't lobby because it's cool tech. I shouldn't have to comply with securities laws. So that's my flip it and say something mm -hmm. critical of maybe some, some developers. Plenty of people didn't do ICOs, of course. Um, yeah. the, Luckily, not everyone. Um, flip, if you're in side. this room, oh. uh, just go ahead and if you had a question that you wrote down, I think Anthony and Josh have picked up most of them, but make sure that they get them. We're going to start Q&A Q &A here in a second. I think Eric wanted to. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yep. uh, I'll take up the mantle of defending the ICO boom to some degree. Um, surely a whole bunch of crappy projects got way more money than they ever should have, and people should have been much more diligent about which projects they funded. All true. And there's certainly plenty of fraud and scams. All true. Um, there are also a few shining lights there. And of course, the best example of this is Ethereum itself, which ran the biggest token sale that had ever happened ever uh, up to that point on, on essentially a promise of something that hadn't been built yet on huge hype, and they delivered. And they actually built one of the most important cryptos the world has ever seen. They've changed the world. Um, and I'm glad that they did that. I'm glad that they didn't spend five years trying to navigate securities laws um, instead of releasing that and actually just going forward. So yes, you know, maybe nine out of 10 examples are bad, but those, those rare ones that actually raised money and built something great, um, I think those deserve to be noted as well. Yep, and I'd like to sneak in one question off the back of this discussion as well before we move into the audience questions. Um, but this is really, you know, we have this idea that every technology can be used for quote unquote good or bad as though that kind of delineation is such a bright line. Um, but certainly a lot of technologies, I would wager all of them, can be used for many different purposes. And we often hear the argument that technology itself is neutral or that developers should be neutral. Do you think that that's actually a good argument to make? Um, or should we actually be asking uh, creators of this technology, whether you're a developer or at some other Point in the supply chain, um, should, should we be telling people that in truth you really cannot be neutral? If you're working on a project like one of these, um, you simply will never be viewed as neutral and you have an obligation to almost uh, advocate through what you create or no? What's the right? I mean, not, not if what you're doing is publishing code. It, it, can't be a legal, it can't be a legal obligation to publish code of a certain type because... We're not talking about a legal obligation here anymore, though. We're so talking it, about... Moral ethical? Yeah. I, Probably. I guess that's not my field. <laughs> I, think, I think it's fair I finally to, found something Peter won't talk about. I, I think it's fair my my fear that. is if you get into a position where a centralized entity like a government is telling people what is good and bad, and with regard to writing code, that's game over. Because even something that seems to have absolutely no legitimate purpose, like a, vi a computer virus or, that has a purpose. or a spoofing algorithm, legitimate purpose, even something that seems to have no legitimate purpose, we need to have free speech protections for those, those hideous things because people need to be able to talk about them to stop them. A, a, a proprietary trading firm that has a, an algorithm that will spoof markets might be doing it because they need to train their AI to identify other people spoofing transactions on markets. The fact that they developed their version to train their AI should not subject them to any legal obligations. They might have a moral ethical obligation to keep that thing 
maybe confidential, not share it with their friend who they know is a known criminal, all kinds of things like that. But when you get down to the question of whether people can or cannot write something on paper or uh, in a terminal window, it, you, it can't be a distinction, I think, made by governments because that's the road to totalitarianism and, 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 and the end of free speech. So, Jeff, I think do you think that, just to phrase it, uh, do you think that developers should uh, are naive if they do not consider adversarial uses of what they create? I don't think they're necessarily naive. Um, I think they should. They should think about the, uh, the, you know, the, the uses to which that technology will be put. Um, but there, but there, you know, there, 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 there's a difference between speech and action. You know, and, and code is speech. And then the action is what you use it for. Um, the, the analogy that I sometimes uh, draw when, when describing that, that you know, technology's neutral position is that uh, you, can use a, you can use a kitchen knife to stab someone or you can use it to chop vegetables. The fact that you can use it to stab someone doesn't mean that we should ban knives. You know, that would make life very difficult in the kitchen. Um, so, and you know, it, 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 it's that some, some technologies may end up being skewed or may end up being so heavily used, um, for criminal purposes that, that their creators should maybe, you know, um, uh, should, should maybe think again about their actions. I remember ch chatting, uh, about this with, with Brian from, from Obi-Wan, the, the creators of, of Open Bazaar, um, we were in London and, and, a, and a journalist was asking us about you know, how we felt about the fact that you know, Zcash and Open Bazaar were potentially being used by criminals. And we, we give them that answer and, and they said, well, we'll put, you know, he, he pushed further and he said, well, what if it turned out that the vast majority of usage was by criminals? And I think we both went, well, you know, if, that, if it were proven to be the case, then, you know, we, we might have to, you know, we agreed that we would probably have to reconsider whether we wanted to continue working and developing and improving that project, if it turned out that it was overwhelmingly being used by criminals. Now, I think that the people who work on Monero and on Zcash do so because they believe in the right to privacy. Um, and I think that that in and of itself is, is taking a, a moral and ethical position and um, enacting that position through their authorship of the code. And I'd love to hear this from the other side as well. Um, yeah, I mean, Jerry, do you want to take it up from here? Um, no, I mean, just to echo what's been said, I, I really don't have another uh, different answer. Yeah. I, I think every person expresses their, their moral and ethical qualities through their actions each day. So the, the, the things that you spend your time doing are the expression of, of your moral actions. Um, much more than what you think, what you think of, of morals and ethics in your head, what you actually spend your time doing is, is your morals, is your ethics. Um, and so I think there's, there's not really any way to be, to be neutral. I mean, certain, certain projects are not going to have moral and ethical effects as much as others will. Um, but certainly whatever you're doing is, is that expression. And, and I think that's, that's hugely powerful. I mean, that's why, that's why crypto has, has taken off um, because millions of people around the world find this stuff to be profoundly important for humanity and they've put their time and energy into it. Um, and so I, I love seeing that and I think that should continue. And I would say this too, that, um, you know, people, um, Developers who, who are developing the software, um, you know, they're doing it because they believe what they're doing is good. I think it's going to be a very small minority of people who are developing these things because they actively think this is going to be bad for the world. They're doing, they're going to be doing harm. Um, and I think even when you when you um, uh, try to judge somebody, you know, and say, you know, is uh, is what they're doing um, have a net positive in the world? Um, if you use a standard like the journalist um, Jack, who asked you, you know, what if it was what if Zcash was um, being used mostly for illegal transactions? You know, even then, if we're talking about morality and ethics and that law, um, 
maybe those things that are illegal uh, shouldn't be and are indeed you know, still more on ethical uses. Um, so even if you're facilitating something that is illegal in China, like you know, um, uh, uh, assembly among people who the state doesn't want to assemble, well, I, I think that's still something you should be doing. All right, great, thanks. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into, for the last 20 minutes of our time here, uh, some questions from the audience, both on the Monero side and over on the Zcon side. Um, and so the first question that we have, which I'm paraphrasing just a little bit here um, from the audience, asks, how might different current or future classifications of different crypto assets as some kind of commodity, security, you know, maybe someday even currency, whatever that's supposed to mean, affect the regulatory landscape? And you know, is, is that distinction important? And if so, should there be advocacy around particular kinds of classifications? So um, if you limit yourself to true cryptocurrency, right, things where you have a running network um, with a token that is um, native to the network, right? So we're talking here about Bitcoin, Zcash, Ethereum, and the like. Um, then that thing, and I'm talking here about the US, um, uh, that thing is gonna be considered a commodity. Um, uh, and so that classification um, really, you know, uh, uh, has very little bearing on what users do. Um, it has, the only bearing it really has is for um, uh, markets uh, in the thing. If they're going to be offering uh, futures, um, it's going to be regulated by the CFTC. Also, the CFTC, um, it does not supervise cash markets, spot markets for um, these things, um, but it does have uh, sort of anti-fraud authority, right? Uh, so sort of after the fact policing for manipulation um, and the like. That could change. Um, and I can imagine Congress um, looking to create some authority at the CFTC um, or elsewhere that would create some kind of market supervision for, for those markets. Um, beyond that, the only other classification that really matters is for tax purposes. Um, and so today, cryptocurrency is not classified as a currency. Um, because currency is defined in law as the uh, coin of a nation state, and these things are not. Uh, which is really funny, though, because if some state were to adopt a cryptocurrency as its national currency, then that would change US law, which is really interesting. Um, but it's a, it's a weird thing that, that uh, probably will never happen, or maybe it will. Um, I have little um, uh, hope that the law would be changed to reclassify crypto as um, currency, and that has positive and negatives. The positive is, is that you're an investor um, and you're um, buying and holding for the long term. If you ever sell um, and you experience capital gains, you're going to be taxed at a capital gains rate, which is more advantageous than the alternative, which would just be your marginal tax rate, so that's good. The downside um, is that uh, if you're using cryptocurrency as currency, right? If you're using it to buy goods and services, um, you are disposing of of, uh, of 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 the crypto and creating a tax event every time you buy something. So if I buy um, Monero today and tomorrow or next week the price has gone up and I buy a cup of coffee, technically I've experienced capital gain there. My obligation as a taxpayer is to note that, report that, and pay taxes on that, even if it's pennies. And so that creates so much friction that it makes the thing um, very difficult uh, to really gain wide acceptance. And if you think about it, it kind of is um, a showstopper for just the networks themselves. Because if you think about Ethereum, every time you run a smart contract, you have to pay gas. That paying gas is a taxable event, potentially. Um, we don't have hope that we're gonna be able to change the, um, the law there um, to try to reclassify. So what we've done is that we have um, uh, worked on a bill that would create a de minimis exemption uh, from tax uh, for small transactions. Um, it was $600 in the last Congress. This Congress will be re reintroduced probably lower um, as a compromise, would be around 250. Um, and so any transactions below that amount, if this bill passes, you don't have to worry about. Um, so that's the way we're, we're trying to address that. Yeah, anything to add, Eric? I think crypto is doing a great job at destroying categories that used to make sense. 
This is very visible in the securities realm. The SEC is unable to tell you exactly which tokens are securities. They, they pretend, they feign that it's obvious, but it is not. Um, they can't even do that with just the topic of securities. The fact that Bitcoin came out before CryptoKitties meant that um, the New York Bit License classified Bit CryptoKitties as a virtual currency, and it is illegal now in New York. Oh, illegal in New York to sell CryptoKitties without a Bit License. Totally absurd, because the stuff tried to get classified by politicians that didn't understand what it was, and um, so. I think uh, it would behoove any regulator to, to wait longer before trying to classify a lot of this stuff, and that makes them uncomfortable. Um, but even those of us in the industry can't give you lots of good definitions for these things, because part of what makes them cool is that they break down these definitions. Yeah, I think just, just briefly on the broad topic of whether you want classification or not, you, you don't. And, and that's not necessarily something that's totally new to cryptocurrency. The best laws that we have are laws that are activities-based that regulate people doing something with things in the world. Because laws should regulate people, they shouldn't regulate things. And so in the anti-money laundering context, despite us sort of you know, treating that as the main topic and a big threat or something like that, things have been pretty good because in the US and abroad, the anti-money laundering statutes are based on activities. Did you transmit money for someone else? And there's been, I think, reasonable progress in developing a, a definition of what that activity means in the context of virtual currency. It means, at least transiently, having some of the virtual currency on behalf of your customer and helping them give it to somebody else. And that creates a surprisingly bright line standard that makes for pretty easy compliance for people to figure out whether they are in or out of an anti-money laundering regime. And I, 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 I think the outcome has been great that we now know for sure that open source software developers and non-custodial wallet providers and even people who write DEX software or might run DEX servers for central order books are, generally speaking, not holding from one person and giving to another and therefore not regulated. Securities laws are a bit of a mess because we constantly think about this classification. It's a security or it's not. Although the actual test for whether something's a security is an activities-based test. It's did you have an investment of money with an expectation of profits relying on the efforts of a third party or promoter. And yeah, maybe the SEC has been a little slow for some people's tastes with defining what that activity means in the context of a metaphor with cryptocurrency. But I actually think they're doing a pretty good job for you know any government agency that's faced with this massive explosion of investment interest in this exotic new instrument and having to learn a lot about you know, the differences between, say, uh, proof of work and proof of stake and a pre-mine versus a, a no pre-mine, a, a pre-sale with a pre-mine, a pre-sale. It, it, it's not an easy task. Um, yeah. OK, let's do one uh, from the audience here. I'm merely a pass-through entity on this question. OK. so. What must happen to Libra in order to take down Facebook? Or alternatively, what must happen to Facebook to take down Libra? I, I guess, aren't they the same? Oh, right, the Libra Association is different. Well, the Libra Foundation is separate, but I believe we're just speaking in general about, I mean, Facebook right now is still a, a larger entity. Any, anyone can go ahead. Is this on again? Yeah, probably the, uh, the right answer there is that we can't answer that until we see how Libra is actually deployed. And also, it will be different on day one than it is 10 years later. So allegedly, from what they say, it's going to start a little bit decentralized, out of, out of their hands to a little degree. And over time, it may become out of their hands to, to some degree. We don't know what degree that will be yet. And so we don't know how closely tied Facebook will actually be to Libra um, or not. Yeah, th I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, there's a lot of armchair experts on Twitter giving very, very detailed analysis based on a whole bunch of assumptions, some of which are correct, some of which are just un, unfounded. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, it, it's creating a focal point for, for all of this stuff and, you know, for, for privacy in general, uh, which I think is good. I actually think it's, it's, it's good that, that this conversation is happening uh, uh, sooner rather than later, and um, yeah, but I, 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 I have no direct answer to that particular question. 
sort of lightning answer as to what their biggest problems are probably going to be. I'd say if you have an association of member companies from different countries with different standards of, say, sanctions, unsanctioned nations where you can't make payments, um, are you going to comply with the lowest common denominator? And that would usually be the U.S., which has the most strict sanctions regime, and just not you know, allow any transactions to a Libra address in Iran? Um, or are you going to try and not comply? Or are some of the members of the association going to comply and not comply? And in a BFT consensus, I don't know what that would look like. Maybe some transactions make it through. But then are the U.S. entities in that association party to that decision by their co-association members and therefore violating OFAC? That's really a nightmare. So I would, I would guess they'll just fully comply with OFAC. Um, and credit to Laura Shin for actually bringing that up on her podcast where she interviewed um, someone from Libra. And then the other thing is just, as Jerry said earlier, well, actually, I'll let Jerry say it if he wants to talk about the reserve. And yeah, so I, I just think that um, just to, to play along with the question about, you know, how can Facebook take down Libra? Um, I, th you know, I think that might happen simply because Facebook is the target of a lot of enmity today. Um, you know, there's always one tech company typically um, in the world that, it, you know, or in the U.S. that is just sort of the, the target of um, hatred by both parties um, today. Um, and so that might rub off on Libra. And the way that, you know, the easiest way that um, they could sort of, uh, that the government could if it wanted to um, sort of just call it a day on Libra is to say, well, wait a minute, you have this reserve. What is this reserve? Are you a bank, um, or is this what you you have a basket of um, currencies and securities? You're securitizing these and you're selling these to the public. That's an ETF or some kind of security. So yeah, you're a security. And I think if you look at the definition of security in the Securities Act, um, there are a couple of things in there that you could um, kind of with a straight face say that the reserve is that. In which case, Libra is a security, and then that's it, game over. Um, it doesn't work um, because securities can only be traded on uh, regulated securities exchanges, which an open network is not. So that's how. Um, if Facebook draws enough ire to um, have the government decide that it wanted to, to really do something, that's how I think they might go about it. All right. Um, and so probably time for maybe one kind of last big lightning round question um, with the time that we have left. Um, and this question uh, came from actually a couple of different people on both sides of our talk. Um, and it's kind of general about what kind of the overall message for what we're all doing here is. So I think everyone here and over in Croatia, you know, definitely agrees that privacy and by extension financial privacy is you know critically important to the operation of a society, and you know also a, kind of a fundamental human right. And you know we hear all the time in the news and from other people that we might talk to that the idea of a private transaction you know is somehow associated with criminality or with you know bad faith actions, the classic arguments, right? What's what's the response that we should be giving to that to help convince others, whether or not they're people we know or our legislators, anyone else, that what we're doing is important and that what we believe in here is important? Great question. The thing I worry most about is that, m at least in the US, most people don't seem to really care about privacy, um, nor do they believe the moral arguments for it. Um, they will not fight to defend it, and many of them are highly skeptical of anyone who does. I think that's really dangerous. Um, Ultimately, if the majority of the public is opposed to privacy, uh, that will trickle into policy and that will end up becoming in direct competition or direct clashing with anyone who's trying to advocate for it. Um, the analogy I like to use is that everyone in their home has shades on their windows and they expect a certain degree of privacy in their homes. And no one questions that. Um, they expect a certain degree of privacy in their communications with each other. Uh, two people who talk among each other, no one would say that the, the government should automatically listen to that all the time and make sure that no one's talking about you know, their terrorist activities. Um, when you send an email to someone else, even though it's not really that private, you know, people generally, people are okay with, with 
encrypted information going between each other and, and messages, and like they, they understand why that's, that's useful. But for some reason, when it comes to money, all that goes out the window, and people believe that everyone's transactions should be surveilled all the time. Um, and that's a, a big uh, hypocrisy, a big contradiction in people's views. And I'm hoping that that will be resolved with them applying the value of privacy in transactions and in speech, um, rather than in rejecting privacy for both. I mean, so, so answering that question is kind of the, the, the subject of the paper that I published um, in January. And I think part of, of the thing to do when talking to folks is to not just talk about privacy in isolation, but to talk about cash, which is what we're working on. Um, and cash is private, but it's also censorship resistant and permissionless. Um, and, um, and basically, it is a tool that allows you to have autonomy and dignity in the world. Um, and you can, uh, uh, and it's, it's an escape valve from a world in which if you have no cash, you have no way of acting in the world without being watched um, and without having the possibility that you can be stopped from doing what you want to do. And I think when you explain to people in, in those terms, you know, they, they begin to, to sort of think about their implications because everybody uses cash. Um, and they can understand um, uh, that they might not always want to be uh, watched. And I think if you, what you can do is sort of draw a distinction um, between the kind of open society where, um, you can ha you, where, you, where you have autonomy and dignity with a society that is not open and where everything is surveilled. And so China just happens to be a good foil for that. Um, and, and I think drawing that, um, that the, the contrast there I think helps people kind of understand why we and and, there, and sadly there's there are examples that you can use um, from here in the U.S. that shows that we're not immune from going down that path if we're not careful. And uh, for this side, I'll add to what Jerry was saying a uh, little bit extra tweak for you guys um, that as we talk about going cashless, it's this positive kind of conversation. In the U.S., we don't always talk about China. We talk about Sweden and Scandinavian countries. We talk about the convenience of something. And when we also have these ongoing conversations about the reason we don't have mass adoption of cryptocurrencies is the usability. We need to keep working on it until people don't know there's a blockchain in there somewhere. So if we're trying to just make it indistinguishable from Apple Pay, then how do we continue having that conversation to differentiate that cashless and digital access to public cryptocurrency as digital cash are not the same thing? Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I, I um, was talking with uh, a, a guy who runs a really beautiful olive um, plantation on Brach here in Croatia. My wife and I did a little holiday beforehand, I'm not ashamed to say. And he, um, he saw a shirt that I had that had Bitcoin on it, not my Zcash shirt. And he said, oh, you like, you like Bitcoin? I was like, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good technology for enhancing freedom and, and for you know, making us be able to pay each other directly again. And he said, really? Because we had just paid and he doesn't take credit cards. And lots of places in Croatia do not take credit cards. And you get the sense that it's not just because banks won't extend credit, it's because there's a pretty deep seated distrust of credit cards as a technology, because why would you bring this third party into your life? Why would you bring this bank into your life when two people can face each other and pay each other? And he had the, the, the notion that Bitcoin was probably like that. Why would you bring this Bitcoin technology and whoever's behind it into your life? So what was difficult to convey, and I don't think I, I did a great job, I think I did my best, is that well, actually, it's, it's, it's software on your phone, and you have software on your desktop at the, at the museum, the olive oil uh, factory museum, and it's going straight from the phone to the desktop. I, and it, you know, we had a great conversation, but the, 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 the prejudice that a lot of people come to with this technology, and rightly so, because all technology is financial except cash, have progressively eroded their privacy is that a new technology is just going to be a new middleman, a new master, and a new person to comply with the totalitarian government and you know, pull their liberty away. And, and in the case of Bitcoin, you could argue that's true because it's, it provides the that's totalitarian true. governments with that ledger of every single transaction. So at least it's censorship resistant. And so we shouldn't rag on Bitcoin too much. Is <laughs> at least there's no government that necessarily could, at least without tremendous expenditure of resources, step in and stop people from using the network. Uh, but they could certainly learn a lot about the people who do that, which is 
yay, Monero, Zcash, <laughs> and Mimblewimble and Grin and everything else. Um, and then the other brief thing I wanted to say was just that story there from cash to credit cards to big data to cryptocurrency, we should be branding this not as a radical new idea. This is a, this is a tradition driven idea. What is radical, what should be deeply questioned by everybody is the idea that you can only pay through a system that collects information and that all that information will be aggregated by powerful parties. That is a radical plan for the future that we should criticize with, with all the energy we have. And the plan for the future that Bitcoin and Monero and Zcash have is a return to peer-to-peer, face-to-face transactions that build communities, that build economies without creating that liability of some super powerful person in the middle. Or the rent extraction. Or, yeah. yeah. So Jack, how do we prove to people a, a negative, this kind of the value that this information was not disclosed? How did we make them feel that uh, when they don't really un feel their data being siphoned from them every day then? So you point at incidents where security or privacy breaches have had consequences. The obvious one is the, the last US election. You, I you it was totally fine. <laughs> I read something, it was actually okay. You, you, you pointed things like the Equifax breach. You asked them whether they would like anybody, you, I asked them whether they would like um, every bank in the world to publish every single transaction onto the internet so that if I know your bank account number, um, I can go and look up all your financial activity. And finally, I, I point to um, legislation. So in the EU, there's the GDPR, which, you know, places, um, you know, has been enacted to protect individuals' privacy. And in the US, uh, I've got an example here in front of me, which I'm going to read out uh, from the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. And it says, it is the policy of the Congress that each financial institution has an affirmative and continuing obligation to respect the privacy of its customers and to protect the security and confidentiality of those customers' non-public personal information. And in a world where, uh, you know, centralized financial institutions in the form of companies and, uh, and you know, banks are being replaced by decentralized financial uh, software structures and networks, you know, I think that that still applies. And I think, you know, uh, people who create these networks, whether it's us, um, in the Monero and Zcash communities, whether it's, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, I know that, that uh, Vitalik's been talking recently about ways of adding privacy to, to Ethereum, or indeed, you know, Facebook with Libra. I think we all have um, a responsibility to protect our users' privacy. It's such a wonderful note to kind of come and conclude on. And I can say that, you know, it was complete coincidence that Zcon and MoneroCon happened to fall over the exact same days. But it is good to know that there is this fundamental base of things that we all seem to really agree on and communicate with each other about. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure both here and to speak with you virtually. So I'll let you wrap as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what what we're all trying to do, even though it may be using different kinds of technology and different approaches, is I think go toward the same goal of you know of financial privacy and everything that we've talked about that that implies for society and for individuals. So huge thank you to all the panelists um, and to everyone who has participated um, in the audiences here over in Croatia or watching online. Um, this is great and I hope we can continue this kind of collaboration to you know, spread the word about what we're doing and why it's important in the future. So thanks to everyone. Thank you.